I'd like to thank you for coming, as the art mistress said to the gardener. Um, can you all hear me? Uh, are you, any of you wondering if, am I in the right place? And the answer is no. Um, well, we're going to try and do the best we can, which is <laughs> a bit of a worry. <laughs> You've got to read carefully if you... Um, well, I think you get the message. Um, you will have noticed if you study marketing at all or you go on the internet every now and then, you do go on the internet every now and then, uh, that it's... Uh, oh, I must apologise, but at this point, is there anybody here who doesn't like swearing? <laughs> anybody, please, because... It's if so, you're in fucking trouble. Um, you'll have noticed that, well, a lot of people that go on the internet are fucking gullible, yeah? Um, but what people don't comment so much about is the fact that most of the people who send out stuff to people who go on the internet are fucking gullible as well. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, some of you have seen my jokes before both of them. Um, there are two gentlemen here who've got nothing else to do but come and <laughs> recite them to me before I tell them. Um, well, this is a joke from my friend, my, one of my friends in Australia, who says that marketing is like teenage sex. Um, everybody talks about it. And some people are doing it. None of them are doing it very well. And I'm going to demonstrate that at considerable length this morning. Now, one of the reasons why they're not doing it particularly well is because they're bloody clueless. And that's not just my opinion. There is an organisation called Fournays who spend their time uh, analysing uh, what marketing people are doing around the world. And I think that the last time I saw they, they were analysing like two billion messages or something. Amazing amounts of money spent to see uh, how well people were doing and whether they had a vague clue, a smidgen of a clue, about what they were doing. And this is what they discovered. It seems that most people in marketing are unaware of the fact that there is a relationship between um, marketing and competence, and they're unaware that there is a relationship between marketing and money. So I'd, I'd like to congratulate all of you because you're all here because you know that if you don't make any money, you're going to be in trouble. And most of the people you're competing with in marketing are completely unaware that it's got anything to do with money. <coughs> as a matter of fact, they're completely unaware of almost everything as far as I can make out. So this is what they think is important. Brand awareness is their top... I would, ROI, KPI, which means, you know, what you measure. Return on investment, KPI. Key performance indicator. By the way, if, if you meet people, if you come across people in business who talk about things like ROI, KPI, tell them to fuck off, yeah? <laughs> so that 50, because they're all mad about right, social media now. Actually, it's content. How many people here are interested in content marketing? Any of you? That's all right. Um, I read a definition of content marketing uh, yesterday on my way in by the man who runs a spurious organisation called the Content Marketing Institute. What you, the, what you do with, with marketing is somebody comes up with something else and somebody else says, let's start a bloody institute. People think we know what we're talking about. Anyhow, so this guy, he defines this content marketing as anything. It's anything, anything you like, yeah? Anything you like. How do you market without content? Please tell me. So, 31% believe reaching the audience is marketing return on investment. I mean, you can speak to a lot of people, but if they don't do anything, it's not very effective, is it? And this is what they said was, every Tom, Dick and Harry is a marketer. Well, bullshit is, yeah. So, the, one of the purposes here is to try and uh, bring some sort of relationship between marketing and reality and money and, you know, how much money you make and so on. So that's what I'm going to try and do. 
That's supposed to make a nice noise, but it isn't. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. The title of this little talk is Just Salesmanship because that's what it's all about. Um, and that's who I am, just in case I forget, because at my age I'm a bit puzzled about a lot of important things. And what am I going to try and do today? I'm going to talk about your objective and what it should be. I'm going to talk about the process and the weapons that you will use to achieve your objective. I'm going to talk about, well, I'm not going to, I, there's a guy who works for me called Al, and he won't come to London because he lives way beyond the ken of mankind, somewhere in Devon. And I've sent lots of the material that you've sent to me uh, and asked him to comment. And sometimes he's not entirely polite. In fact, I've had to remove some of his comments. <laughs> because he's bloody rude, even by my standards. Uh, I'm going to discuss what idiots do so that you don't do it. Um, I'm going to talk about what works in creative. I'm going to give you lots of examples, because one example is worth a ton of waffle. Uh, and I've got a little work for you, not too much, because we sent a questionnaire to find out, would you like to do some work? Only one person said yes. <laughs> Everyone else said, no, 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 don't mind a bit of fun. but. <laughs> and some checklists so that you can uh, make notes of it. And just to, because I see that the Churchill war sellers only give you, like, you know, three sheets of paper to take notes on, we'll try and get some more. You will all get a copy of this appalling presentation uh, in a, a couple of weeks, and you'll get a copy also of Andy's presentation, which is much better. <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen commercials like that that uh, aim to sell the most disgusting drink ever met, invented. And this is the man behind those commercials. Um, he is a Mexican named Sergio Zeman. And I read a book of his called The End of Marketing as We Know It, in which basically he says much better than I will say what a load of tosh most marketing is. And he also simplifies it wonderfully, and it, it sort of reminds you why we're all here, what we're trying to do, and the only thing we have to worry about, yeah? That's what we're trying to do, yeah? That's what we're trying to do. That's what I'm going to try and help you do, yeah? After reading his book, I decided, I spent a lot of time thinking, what do you really have to worry about every day uh, when you decide, what am I going to do today? Yeah? And I decided it was amazingly simple. You have to get more customers, get them to buy more, keep them longer. That's all you have to do. That's all I'm going to talk about. Get more customers. Very simple. There are no other ways to make more money. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, any time you... So how many of you attend meetings? How many of you attend a lot of meetings? Do you? Yeah. When I got my first job as a creative director in London, exactly, well, 19, 40 years ago, was it 50 years ago? 50 years ago, I was a creative director. And I refused to attend any meetings. I said, if you want my opinion, I'll send you a little memo, but I'm not turning up. I've got a bloody job to do. So if what you plan to do will not, you can absolutely convince that it's not going to do any of these things, forget about it, yeah? No other reason to do it. Yeah. So our first job is how can we get these people, get more people to sell more stuff to? And I've decided that <coughs> almost everything in marketing 
can be related to real life. Now, I know that sounds just... If you are sitting in a meeting, you've got, I've got to be sitting there and thinking, what the fuck has this got to do with real life? Yeah? But if you actually relate it to real life, uh, I think you'll do a lot better. So let's talk about... I've been married uh, three times, lived with three other ladies. Well, four if you count six weeks. So I've had seven careless lady owners. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the things I used to spend my time doing, you know, looking for the love of your life. I didn't meet her until I was 68. So, so you need a few good pickup lines. Yeah? Is this what we call the right creative approach? What's your creative approach? It's a good pickup line, yeah? And you try them and you see which one works. You know, I mean, you know the one you walk down Oxford Street and you get a lot of slaps, but you get a lot of fun, you know, if, if you keep on asking people directly for what you want. <laughs> we call it testing. So I'm going to talk about that. You're going to give me your, the benefits of your experience and wisdom on what works and what doesn't. This is something I saw yesterday. Um, it is a great, great advertisement. Um, it's a great advertisement because of all sorts of things, not the layout, but the fact that it's unit and the union. Every, or a, a great many workers in this country are worried about their jobs because of what I consider to be a very unwise move by the, rep, the reptilian Mr. Osborne. Um, so that really addresses what they're worried about, you know, their jobs. You know, so do you lie awake worrying at night, you know? and it gives them an offer, you can join the union. Yeah. It's absolutely brilliant. I have to tell you, I don't like unionism, <laughs> uh, but it's a great ad. Uh, one of the things I would say to you is, if you want to succeed in this business, spend a lot of time looking at things that you see in the paper. You know, on the People say to me, oh, you're very, you're really hard working, Drayton. I'm an idle bugger, yeah? But I spend a lot of time thinking and a lot of time looking at things to see if I can get ideas, you know. And that, so that's what I saw yesterday. And I see something pretty much every day, several things. And so I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of clips of things that interest me for one reason or another. So for what it's worth, that's my advice. So this is Marketing Simplified. Um, I wrote a book which uh, Kelly will try and sell you if you're unwise. <laughs> Uh, which is supposed to be the best on its subject. And the reason I wrote it was because I, I, I was interested in direct marketing. And the only definition of direct marketing I would find was to a two-page infographic. They didn't call them infographics then, they just called it a chart. I would call it like a map of the New York subway system, a bit like that. This was to tell you what direct marketing was. And I thought, can't be that bloody complicated, can it? So I spent a lot of time trying to simplify things all the time because I'm really stupid, you know. And so are most of the people that we're selling to, so we get on really well. <laughs> so this is how, this is the process, yeah? Make an offer only an idiot would refuse, something that nobody can say no to, yeah? Build a database from all the little ways that you can build a database, yeah? Confirm the details of people at top, but don't make it difficult for them, yeah? Don't say, could I have your inside bloody leg measurement before we put you on our list, yeah? Which a lot of idiots do. And you treat people according, the punishment fits the crime, yeah? So you treat people according to who those people are. And that's the essence of human relationships. Think about it, you know. When you meet somebody, you treat that person based upon what, who you think they are and what you think they're about, yeah? Bad marketing doesn't do that. And then you talk to them to maintain loyalty, to upgrade and resell, so they tell you to stop. Um, don't worry, dear, well, you're going to get a video of all this, and I'm going to give you a personal exam to find out whether you've been <laughs> I think there was a place. Oh, you've got a place, yeah. I think there was a gap somewhere. There's one there if you want to sit, if you want me... Yeah. So that's what, and you do it until they tell you to sod off, yeah? Basically, that's it. So come here, I think I'll go now because that's all you really need to know. 
you already know more than most marketers know. Isn't that amazing? And that process applies to all marketing, yeah? I don't care if you're running a supermarket. You adapt the means in which you're communicating with people, that's what it's all about, yeah? I'm sure you've all heard the word, the phrase SEO, yeah, SEO. And I bet, how many of you get mailings, emails from people saying, we are SEO experts, usually written very badly from somebody in India, yeah? Yeah, you, SEO, is what would search engine optimization, isn't that great? Or finding the right people. Yeah. So they say, what keywords and phrases are you looking for? Yeah. So where do most people go? They go to Google. All of us go to Google. I, Google are my last love. So what does Google want? It wants you to find the right answer. When you analyse all the th stuff that's going on, you suddenly go, hey, it's really quite simple. Yeah? They don't see matching pages with different words and blah, 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 blah. It's very, very simple. They've got it down to a fine art. They just look for a page on a relevant authoritative site. So is anybody here worried about whether their site will attract the attention of Google? Any of you? None of you. You are. Well, this is all you have to do. It's very simple. So if they're looking for relevant authoritative stuff, then that's what you put on your website, yeah? Very simple. With lots about what you do and how it helps. That's actually almost every communication, to be frank, again, I could leave again. If all you ever do is send out lots of interesting stuff about what you do and how it helps, you'll probably do better than most other people in the marketing industry. It's astonishing, isn't it? In Japan, uh, every year, they have an award called the Deming Award, named after this man, Mr. Deming. Mr. Deming was sent out to Japan at the end of World War II to help set up Japanese industry. And for whatever reason, the American government who sent him there decided to send this man who was n nothing to do with, he was a statistician. Yeah? And so he just measured everything, and they, he transformed Japanese industry, because yeah. he just said, you've got to measure everything. Yeah. And what we're talking about today, direct marketing really, it's all about measuring. Yeah. And it's all about having a process. So this is the process. And this is a variation of what I said to you in words. You know something if you want to say something? If you want to get into people's brains so that they remember things, you've got to say things at least three times. Yeah? Yeah, so this is the second time of saying. And this is something I concocted when I was working on the Reader's Digest account uh, to <coughs> try and explain in visual form what the Deming formula is all about. Well, you want to acquire new customers. As a result of acquiring new customers, you will grow your data. And you will try new creative approaches to see if you can acquire new customers or sell to customers more cheaply, more effectively, yeah? And you'll come up with new offers or incentives uh, to get people interested, yeah? You'll target better because you look, you're measuring everything. You're looking to see what's working and what's not working, yeah? So you make more money. This means higher value per name. In other words, each, each person that you're acquiring is going to make you more money because you've found better ways of making money out of people, right? So then you start all over again. It's a wonderful little process and it goes round and round and round and that's the way you should be thinking about what you're doing. Yeah? Do, is, is what I'm saying making sense? Please tell me because I, yeah. sometimes I arrive at places and I think, oh shit, I'm in the wrong place. Yeah? <laughs> so the key to all this is what we call the magic one number, which is something that we I, I didn't develop. We developed at Ogilvy and Mather when I used to work there. Um, the magic number is the value of a customer to you. Yeah. How much is a customer worth to you? If you know how much a customer is worth to you, then you know how much you can afford to pay to get a customer. And if you're looking at your money, you know how long you can keep spending money to get a customer. So generally speaking, I can tell you how long it is. How many people here 
belong to Arthur Aitken? Well, I can tell you, you know, how long it takes for me to get a customer if I pay three pounds to get a name, yeah? How long it will take me before I get my money back, yeah? And most of my time, this is rather sad, actually. I spend a lot of my, this is very sad. I spend a lot of my time working out how can I get customers to pay me enough money to pay back what it cost me to get the customer more quickly, yeah? That's all I think about. We're working on it at the moment, and I think we've got it down to about five days, which means, God help people, because we're going to be flooding the country with rubbish about join our straight. And <laughs> but, so that's how it works. You, so what are you trying to do? Make the magic number bigger. Yeah? Make the value of a customer bigger. Because yeah? that's the commodity, the commodity you're dealing with, customers. Acquire customers for less, keep them longer, get them to spend more. Very simple. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you're selling, unless you're selling London Bridge to idiots. Yeah, um, that's the business you're in. Here's an example uh, from a, a client called E. Roche, who did a measurement of uh, customer value, and depending on what you offer to people. They are likely to be good customers, bad customers, rotten customers, yeah? So people who are offered, what I'll talk about incentives, which are a very good thing, but people who are just promised better skin care as opposed to being saying, here's a fantastic deal, they turned out to be better customers, yeah? That's not always the case, but in this case it was, yeah? They had 3.2 times more lifetime value, yeah? So even though they were more expensive to get, they were worth more. Just a demonstration of how important it is to measure every damn thing. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it, yeah? So women 32 to 45, this is not really surprising because they're selling, you know, things to make you look better. So the older you get, I can tell you, I wish to God somebody would make me look a bit better, yeah? So I'm probably a perfect customer. Um, married women, Lifetime value, yeah? the life, the value of a customer over the time that you, they're with you, yeah, higher than single women. This is your first challenge of the day, ladies and gentlemen. Men, they were actually four times better in terms of lifetime value than women. Can anyone tell me why, apart from those of you poor sods who've seen me before and know all my jokes? Anyone? They were, but, uh, they were bought by women. They were buying four women. They were buying four women. Nope. You should know, anyhow. You've seen, you, I'm out of here. <laughs> Any, anyone guess? Oh, inertia. In, inertia? No, I spent, um, I've, I've been a naughty boy in the past, yeah? So I used to live very near here in Shepherd Market, which is, an interesting part of London. And on one occasion, inadvertently, I ended up in bed with a woman who was not a woman, she was a man. Transsexuals are the ones, the reason why, why they, you know, if you've got a beard, you, you need a lot of makeup, I can promise you. I didn't notice, I was drunk. I'm not a transsexual. <laughs> I know it's fashionable to be a transsexual at the moment, so I'm thinking of, you know, sort of having an operation or something. Like. <laughs> Here are some facts about lists. Yeah, lists. I mean, you know, you've got your customers. You've put, they're on a list. They're on a database. You can call it what you like. You know, uh, David Ogilvie rang me up and sort of once, and he said, "Can you?" He said, "What is this database, Drayton?" And I said, "David, it's just a list. It's just a list with details of people appended." He said, "Oh, I see." <laughs> So the first thing you need to know is that different people are likely to be of different values. You know, so somebody who's inquired from you is two to three times more likely to buy from you than somebody who's cold, you know, somebody who don't. Somebody similar, but, you know, has not inquired from you, yeah? A customer is three to eight times more likely to buy. So in other words, you send a message out to a customer and to somebody who's identical who is not a customer. Actually, I can tell you in my own experience, because I've tested it two or three times, 
<coughs> we found it was about four and a half times on average more likely to buy. Yeah? There are all sorts of things you can conclude from this, and I shall. So, your best prospects, recent customers, yeah, people who bought recently are generally going to be your best customers on your list, yeah? never mind how you found them. Yeah? Frequent customers, people who buy frequently, yeah? big spenders. Yeah? So you're, and this is the right, it's called recency, frequency, monetary value, RCM, yeah? RFM. Yeah? So those, that's, that is the key to what you need to know about a list. You know? and I'm sorry if what I'm saying appears incredibly simple, but if any of you get to know me, and one or two of you do already, you'll know I'm incredibly stupid. Um, and, you know, I try to make it so simple that I can understand it. Hello? Right, you say to Gilbert, do you think this applies to services? It applies to everything. It applies to everything. As far as humanly possible, there is nothing I'm going to say today which does not apply to greater or lesser extent to everything. Yeah. Because, you, because the commodity, ladies and gentlemen, we are dealing with is called human beings. Yeah. It's like people talk about, uh, oh, business people are different. Business, you do not grow a second bloody head on your way to the office. <laughs> yeah. You may, I've sold services, all sorts of, every bloody thing you can think of and a few things you can't. I adopt the same approach in all cases. And I start by thinking, could it be that I'm talking to a human being? Yeah? They're all the same. I'll give you a few examples as we go along. Very, very important. Uh, <coughs> this was uh, pointed out by uh, the data guy at the Reader's Digest, who were clients of mine for years and used to be a wonderful company until they got screwed around. <coughs> and the, the customer you want is like the customer you've got. Yeah. So one of the things you've got to be doing all the time if you want to succeed is think about your customers. What are their characteristics? Because you need people like that. Yeah. Sometimes the, the similarities can be extraordinary. Uh, I used to do the advertising for uh, the world's most expensive cruise line at one time. And we discovered to our amazement that the best list was a list of Scottish gourmets compiled by a friend of mine in near, near Edinburgh. And my partner, Brian, said, he said, well, it, what, it <coughs> if you're a Scottish gourmet, he said, you've got to bloody travel. <laughs> but, it's, but they had these human characters. <laughs> Not true now. So any list with a high similarity to yours is a good bet, and vice versa. So any list that's very little similarity to yours, a rotten bet. If there is a high, if you take two lists and you look at them and you see there's a high degree of overlap, that's likely to be a good list, yeah? The low degree of overlap, you know. <coughs> so, best sources of business are lapsed customers, yeah? Somebody who's been a customer, you know that unless they've changed their nature, they have the characteristics still that made them become a customer. So you can write something to them saying, look, I'm so, you know, I was looking through the, and I noticed you're no longer dealing with us. But I, I want to tell you, we've got something new that I think will interest you, and that's how you get them back. And, I've, and because you, you've been a customer, I've got a special deal for you. And that's literally how simply you talk to people. Yeah? That's how simply you talk. You don't come out with a lot of marketing bullshit. Yeah? <coughs> Recommended customers, because birds of a feather flock together, which is one of the reasons why viral is so important. You know, people are similar. You know? Looking for people who are similar to the people you've got. Sales automation, oh, sales automation, um, which is described as a miracle. It's not a miracle at all. Uh, the way it's done is interesting, and you know I couldn't do it. I don't, you know. But let me tell you, for instance, if you uh, get on my list, you're all on my list. I assume, otherwise. You're definitely in the wrong place, you know. <laughs> the, <coughs> the seminar on the bombing of Dresden is actually next door in a small room. Um, if you get on my list, I will just send, keep sending you messages, yeah? Until you send bombs to my house, yeah? No, until you stop, you're no longer interested. So I can tell you that on my list, 
since I started compiling it. We've had a, just over 50,000 names, yeah? Um, and at the moment we've got about 26,000 names. And of those 26,000 names, just over 20,000 have said, yes, I want to keep on hearing from you, and this is what I'd like to keep on hearing from you about. Yeah? So what happens if you get on the list is I keep sending you stuff. You may have noticed it, yeah? Um, I will send you well over 200 emails. I will keep sending you emails until I'm dead, yeah? And the, the automation comes in, yeah, it, literally, it's automated, it just goes out to you, yeah? How complicated is that? Yeah? I once had a client who sold fillings for pies, we'll come back to me then. Um, so it, you keep on getting these things until you say, no, I'm not interested, yeah? And what we do with the, this is that we measure the results of the different things we send out. And so we will keep changing the order in which you receive these communications. So the ones that are the really hot ones, you get first, yeah? So they get there in declining order, yeah? And all the time I'm thinking of new, because I've got nothing else to do with my time because I'm old, yeah? I'm thinking of new messages to send out to you, and that's, that's just, that's it. And the people talk to you. What, there's a, a huge investment by people who are trying to make everything sound complicated. That, that wasn't complicated, was it? Very simple. It's all very simple. My job is to make it clear how simple it is. You know. So you will escape the, the boa constrictors of bullshit. The boa constrictors, I've just invented that. Do you like that? <laughs> how many people here love words? If you don't love words, you better start bloody loving words because that's, that's the ammunition, babe, yeah? That's the ammunition. So I'm always looking for words, and every time I come up, invent something, I'm so pleased. And you know what makes a great thing that people can't think? I can, I'll tell you right now, I can send you out an email tomorrow if I wanted to, and say, and the heading will be, meet the bar constrictions of bullshit. It will get such a fucking opening rate, yeah? <laughs> and I'll talk to you about why it will get such an open rate. Albert Einstein has said many, many things, some of which he didn't say. <laughs> as far as I can make it up. <coughs> oh, it's not Albert Einstein, it's Mark Twain. I'm terribly sorry. I just, they all look the bloody same, you know. They're old and hairy. They all got more hair than me, the bastards. Um, you see, I have to remember a lot of this stuff, you know, because I click the thing and I go there and I think, oh, well, that comes as a bit of a surprise. How <laughs> did that creep in there? You know? Where, I've lost my place, you know. So, you know, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I'm showing you this because uh, there is a great tendency uh, for people to think in terms of a particular form of communication, one that they find congenial, one that they find easy to use, yeah? And a particular marketing medium, a particular form of activity. Well, I have news for you. That's as though you can only do sing one song. Yeah. It's not good enough. Yeah. So I made a list about three years ago of all the different marketing disciplines that I think you should be aware of. And yep, I am not very clever, you know. I'm pretty stupid, but if I can understand all these things, you can, because you're all smarter than me. Because I couldn't bloody well afford to come here and pay all that money to listen to somebody telling bad jokes. So here are some of the, the weapons that you should be aware of, that you have to understand, yeah? You have to understand research and why it doesn't work, because people tell you what they think, but not what they're actually going to do. You've got to understand PR, which I think dollar for dollar, pound for pound, euro for euro, is usually your best investment. Advertising, which is what everyone associates with marketing very, very effective. Point of sale, because when people get into a supermarket, they're ready to spend, and if you say the right thing at the right moment, you're gonna make more money. Sales promotion, you know, big offers, good way of building your list. Direct and interactive, which is the, the thing that I've spent a lot of my time uh, trying to understand. 
I would point out that every single thing on the internet is direct. Yeah? Every single. I was in India uh, last year, and the the year time I, before I I was in India, which was 2002, I was on the um, the news in New Delhi because obviously it was a slow news day. <laughs> day and the guy said to me, he said, "So how do you feel about this um, this?" this stuff on the computers, you know, blah, blah, blah. He said, so is it, do you think, is it, uh, you know, what do you think? I said, it's accelerated direct marketing. And I said, I walked out, and, because it's great. I can think of something this morning, and, which I didn't. But I usually do think of something in the morning. And um, by lunchtime, I can have it going out to you. And by tea time, I know whether it was a great idea or not. Yeah, fantastic. Whereas, uh, you, you, it used to take me six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, to think of a mailing, you know, to create the mailing, to print the mailing, to send the mailing out, to get the results of the mailing. So now I can make mistakes much faster than I ever did before. It's brilliant. Actually, when I was walking out of that interview, there was a very distinguished looking gentleman sitting in the little entry place in the little, and he said to me, so that was very interesting. And I said, thank you very much. And I walked out and I said to the guy who was driving me around, I said, who is that? He said, so that is the finance minister of India. <laughs> Word of mouth, yeah? If you, uh, somebody did a survey a while ago to find out why people had bought the last product they'd bought. What, was, what prompted them? Uh, it was actually to do with cars. And word of mouth, somebody recommended it to me, yeah? Came way out ahead of everything else. Whereas, in fact, the firms are spending most of their money on TV advertising. And you know what TV advertising for cars is like, yeah? They were selling cars, yeah? You know, let's... Uh, I will get a helicopter and we show a picture of this car going up a mountain park. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll show a picture of it doing somersaults because that's what you want to do with a car, right? You know, that's where they were spending the money, but not on trying to get people to recommend to other people. Salespeople, the most expensive but most powerful commodity in marketing. Yeah? Nothing is more powerful than one person sitting opposite you if he's really good selling to you. All messages that you create should be based on what a good salesman would say. Yeah? Experiential. I'm the chairman of a company which sometimes I think is doing very well and then I find out it isn't that does experiential, which is really, you know, demonstrations. Go and drive the car. So we do work for people like Bentley and so on, you know, who keep on screwing us to the ground. Um, but nothing is more powerful than experiencing something. Yeah? Try it. Yeah? Pack design. I had a client who specialised in pack design and they stay amongst the things I show. Anybody ever drunk a thing called J2O? Yeah? That was never advertised. J2O was sold, was promoted absolutely on the pack design, the fact you couldn't ignore it. Yeah? No, no promotion at all. And it's a, the product's a joke. It's just bloody fruit juice with water, for Christ's sake, you know. Yeah, I'd like some fruit juice, but less of it. <laughs> yeah. Sponsorship. I once did a, a film for Philip Morris uh, on the Marlborough racing car sponsorship. And I, I, I went ra back to the origins of the... Marlborough Man, which was actually created by somebody I knew called Daniel Draper, um, Leo Burnett, a long time ago, and related to things. And the chairman of uh, Philip Morris uh, saw, they showed the film once in, uh, in Cannes. Um, and I, was, I said, what happened to the film? I said to the guy who paid me to write the script, he said, he said, the chairman showed it to everyone and he said, and then he said, lock this film away, nobody will ever see it again. Because <laughs> it really analysed, you know, the way that people had linked, they'd linked uh, cigarettes to masculinity. Mm -hmm. So that sponsorship, with that, they originally asked me, to, can you evaluate, the, you know, how effective sponsorship is? Very difficult to do. Workplace marketing, the most valuable com commodity you have in your business is your people. Uh, apart from, uh, maybe more important than your product, yeah? If they don't make it happen for you, if you want to do it all yourself, good, good luck, yeah? But my greatest thrill is when I meet somebody 
new that I think is good. Yeah? I think, wow, you know, wow, you know, this person can help me. Yeah. This person can help me. <coughs> Cause related marketing, charity, yeah? Guerrilla marketing, that's anything other than <laughs> all the others, yeah? <laughs> So one guy made a fortune writing about guerrilla marketing because it sounds great, you know. Guerrilla marketing, God, we're going to go out and kill people secretly. <laughs> yeah. So I have a daughter, I have several. Um, one of my, my youngest daughter, in fact, if you don't behave yourself, I'll play you some of her records. Um, and I was going to visit her, uh, as I do four or five times a year, in a place called Montclair, which is... Uh, New Jersey, outside New York. Most expensive place in America, as I, I discovered after I paid for the house. Um, and I was going, going along and I saw there was a, 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 a little sign on a pole. Yeah? And it said, we pay best prices for property. Phone number. I thought, oh, that's great. You know. And then just above it, there was another sign, same size, but slightly different typeface. It said, we pay more than them. <laughs> Guerrilla marketing. Yeah. It's anything, <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know what I mean? That is ambushing. Yeah? This is not Mark Twain. <laughs> 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 this is the other geezer. Will it blend? That is the question. It seems like I've been waiting forever for my Apple Watch. While I was waiting, I made my own iWatch. But it was way too clunky. Thankfully, the real Apple Watch is finally here. And boy, is she a beauty. Thank you, Tom. That is nice of you to say. Siri, it's so good to see you again. You too. It has been a while. So Siri, I've blended just about everything that Apple makes. Yes, it has been both inspiring and disturbing. But there's one thing that I haven't blended yet. I know, don't say it. The Apple Watch. But the Apple Watch is a work of art. It should be on your wrist, not in a blend tech. Siri, I'm afraid there's no other way to answer the question, will it blend? Ouch. Then this is goodbye, farewell, Tom. Move over, Dick Tracy. I think I'm going to press the force touch button. Ow, boof, ah, ow, ouch. Boof, ah. seen those before? Have you seen them before? Bloody amazing, yeah? He blends every goddamn thing, you know. I've got one of my feet blended. <laughs> it's a demonstration. Very, very powerful. I live uh, in Bristol and a minute away from where I live, my flat in Clifton, there's a house and that's one of the, there's like a statue there, yeah? Um, actually there's a lot of statues, yeah? Who lives in the house? Anyone guess who lives in the house? The, 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 the sculptor lives in the house. That's how he advertises his sculptures, yeah? He's got a load of the things outside his house. You can't beat a demonstration. I can talk to you for a little. I'm a great artist. Have a look at one of my bloody scorpions or whatever. You know. <laughs> the great problem 
uh, that we wrestle with is not the meaning of life. <laughs> it's how can we get people to respond? Yeah? So I spend a fair, fair amount of time thinking about that. That's your great deadliest enemy. I, I, I used to handle the American Express account around the world, and I had a client, a very, very funny guy. We became quite good friends. Um, and I remember sitting in a meeting with him, and he used to get pretty excited. I'd noticed, by the way, that if you want to succeed in this business or any other business, it is a very good idea to get pretty excited about it. Because you know? if you don't care about it, you know, you're dead and buried. So he said, they were talking about, you know, 2% response and blah, blah, blah. And he said, what are all you guys talking about? Never mind the 2%, what about the 98%? That's what you've got to think about all the time. Not the people that are replying, but the people who aren't replying and how you can make them reply. And I haven't covered this, on, I don't think in this. One way you can make them reply is to make them choose, yeah? I think I may have a, thing, a demonstration of that somewhere here. I can't I've got so many examples, it's frightening. Trivial, unbelievable. Um, so you make them choose. So you say, would, are you interested? Yes, no, maybe, yeah? And once you've chosen, you know. Simply making people choose will increase your response, yeah? And if they said maybe, then you can write to them again and say something to them that relates to maybe, you know, what didn't I tell you? And if you, they've said no, you can actually write and say, are you sure? When I, uh, for some 20 odd years, I worked on the Everest uh, double glazing stroke, blah, 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 account, another business that's been totally screwed by the people who are running it. Um, and uh, my client, who became a very good friend, you know, there's an old legal maxim, Never make your friends your clients, or would make your clients your friends, yeah? So he said, he said, hey, he said, what would happen if we wrote to the people who've all said, who've all said they don't want to hear from us? I said, fuck off, Paul. <laughs> We're all going to go to jail. He said, no, no. He said, I'm serious. I said, well, let's go and have a drink and talk about it. And I wrote, uh, essentially, a very simple thing, a very short thing that said, um, are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to have sound? That is the second best list that they use, the people who said no. Yeah? <laughs> and you know why? Because if you take the trouble to say no, you're more interested than you are if you do nothing, yeah? <laughs> that dog is inertia, yeah? You're trying to get rid of inertia. By the way, this is all coming as a bit of a surprise to me. Um, because I put these things together, I never quite know what I'm going to say. It's a bit of a worry. This is the big question. Yeah? To whom are you offering what ultimate advantage? Yeah? It's the difference between benefits and features. Yeah? Not what it does, but what it does for people. Yeah? and not what it does for people. What's the real ultimate advantage? Yeah? And who is this person? Who is this person? How narrowly can I define that person? Yeah? I'm trying to bring these two things together. That thing, that service, that product, whatever it may be, and that person. And the more clearly I can define that person, that perfect customer, and define the benefits of what I'm offering, and bring them together, the more successful I will be. Yeah? So that's a very important question. So the first thing you have to do is to define what you sell and write it so even a halfwit can understand it. This is <coughs> particularly important with technical products. Yeah? You say, why a half-wit Drayton? Why a half-wit? Because most people are stupid. Yeah? I've got news for you. If they're not stupid, they're stupid when they're getting your stuff. Nobody sits there and thinks, oh great, I've just seen a TV commercial, let me watch it again. Yeah? It's so exciting. Oh great, I've just seen an email, let me read it three times to make sure I got it right. Yeah? So even very clever people, are stupid when they get your messages. Yeah? So you better make it so clear that even an idiot can understand it. 
Not just what it is, but what it does. Mm. One of the greatest mistakes people make is to say, this is what, I've got this thing, yeah? But they don't say, what it, what's it going to do for me? You know, I don't care you've got this thing. Yeah? What's it going to do for me? Yeah? So there we are. What does it do for your prospects? Incredibly important. I have uh, you know, dealt with many, many large companies, probably more than most people around, because I've been around for more than most people have. Um, and there's one question that every customer has that most of the people I meet in marketing never ask themselves. Yeah? They never think, this is what this person... And it's a, a question so childishly simple, it's a joke. And it's this, why should I choose you? Yeah? Why should I choose you? Why should I choose you? Yeah? That's what's going through people's minds. So, what's special about what you sell? Could anybody else say the same? Yeah? If somebody else can say the same, why should people choose you? Yeah? Do they do the same? Because if so, your proposition is not as strong as it could be. Yeah? And nor is your business. I'm in the middle of trying to write three books, or actually avoiding <laughs> writing three books, one of which has actually been commissioned. I feel so ashamed of myself. <laughs> um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how I begin these books, you know, because that just like the headline and the most important thing is what do you say, what's the title and what do you say at the beginning? Yeah? And I, I, one, one way, uh, opening I've written is to do with where I live and it's to do with walking down the road uh, to Sainsbury's um, and it's about the shops that I see. Yeah? And the, they're all in competition with each other. So a year ago I noticed that people had started, uh, there was a shop doing very well selling greetings cards. Now the are you, can you imagine what the bloody margin is on greetings cards? I bought one yesterday for my girlfriend. £3.15 for a piece of bloody paper, for Christ's sake, yeah? So a lot of people thought, hey, great, you know, this is a great business, you know? Terrific, you know? So there was one greeting card place, WH Smith. Then there was another one around the corner. Then there was another one. Then there was another one. Then there was another one. And I said, I wrote somewhere, I said, most of these people are going to go broke. And four out of five have, because there was no reason to choose one or another. So the most important thing is that how, why should people choose me? You know, because otherwise you, you just oh, I walked into that one. But same thing applied. They've got a row. They've got we've got about seventeen restaurants, and I've bored the hell out of Kelly by dictating stuff about all these restaurants because I started out in the restaurant business in a way, as I shall explain. Um, why should people choose this one? And I give a particular case of one that I predicted would go broke before it did. It didn't even last for three months. But. So, here's a true story for you. How many people here use stories in uh, marketing? People love stories. I mean, sto the story surely must be the oldest form of human entertainment. So. This story begins 72 years ago when a young couple uh, who didn't have a lot of money decided they wanted to send their children to a posh school to turn them into a little gentleman. Yeah? 1943. Uh, the, 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 the man was uh, a very successful salesman with the Dunlop Rubber Company. Um, He'd been, he couldn't go into the army, so he was in the home guard, he'd, he'd, he'd injured himself. Um, and in fact, his number two became the managing director of the Dunlop Rubber Company after he left, some years after he left. But he walked away from this job, and his wife had no commercial experience at all, except she'd done a bit of work as a beautician, came from a very sheltered background. Um, and they decided, for whatever reason, that it would be a good idea to open a pub. 
and that they thought they'd make money by opening it. You know, lots of people talk about, you know, the idiots, they say, I'd like to run a pub. So they decided they want to run a pub. And not only did they decide that they put all the money they could get together and they bought a derelict, and I'm talking seriously derelict pub, in a not very nice suburb of Manchester called Ashton Underline, which is normally only heard of in context of bad jokes on the radio, <laughs> and which is full of, it's now told me, somebody told me recently that Ashton Underline is the murder capital of the North West. I don't know whether this is, is somebody over there smiling, he's, he's, he's agreed, right? So, would I lie to you? Um, so, they bought this pub. And the, the, the thing was that the guy who'd owned it before, uh, I can't remember, the, I don't know what the circumstances were, but he hated having to leave it and he'd left it in a terrible state with rats and beer in the, in the uh, sorry, tea in the beer pumps and horrible you know, devastation. So they, they came along and they, they, they sorted it out and they opened their pub. Um, their pub had one advantage that I can think of, which that Ashton on the Lawn is not full of great places to have fun. Yeah, unless you want to get drunk or hit somebody. So. There are maybe two places, at that time, maybe only one place <laughs> worth going to, and it was called Stamford Park, and it was on the main road to Sheffield. And the only thing this pub had going for it was opposite Stamford Park, yeah, where people would go because there was nowhere else to go. So they had position, you know, they talk about a location, location, location in property. <coughs> Same thing in marketing, in a different way. Yeah, so. so they opened the pub, and they looked around to see what all the other pubs were doing. And they noticed that nobody was offering any form of refreshment. Yeah? And so they started offering sandwiches and soup. And after a while, they did pretty well, and they started offering, they opened a restaurant. And the restaurant did pretty well because the one thing the wife could do was cook and the other thing that was good they had going for them was that their husband was extremely funny um, and entertaining uh, and outgoing. The wife was very shy. She didn't want to meet the customers. She, she had to be fed fairly large quantities of gin and tonic to go and meet the customers. Um, but she was a bloody good cook. And so the restaurant did very well. And the good food guide came out round about them, which transformed British, you know, gastronomy. And they were in the first year of the good food guide, and every year afterwards until they left the pub. But they weren't in it for the food. <laughs> it's just nothing to do with the food. <laughs> they were there because somebody had arrived at three o'clock in the morning at this pub, trying to get somewhere to stay. And the wife had come downstairs and said, certainly, blah, 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 we've got a room. And by the way, would you like something to eat? And he made something, something else. That's how they got into the good food guide. So that what they'd done, they'd looked at the competition and seen what other people were not doing. Uh, they had the characteristics that you want from a pub, in other words, entertaining people. And the, wom the woman was very beautiful, so every man within 50 miles around would come to try and get off with her, and quite a few succeeded um, when she'd had enough gin and tonic. Um, so they understood the essential nature of the pub, you know, hospitality, fun, entertainment, you know, nice people, food, blah, 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 which other people weren't offering. And they did very well, and they were able to send their two sons away to posh schools. But they did not turn them into little gentlemen. And the reason I can tell you this story is because those are my parents. And you can see that I was not turned into a little gentleman. But all they did was basic marketing. Yeah? Here's the opposite. This is a flight uh, on United about a month ago. And I really recommend, you know, if you want to be good at marketing, just never stop observing. You know? Yogi Berra, the great... Uh, Baseball coach died about a week ago, and one of his sayings, which I've, is in one of my books actually, is you can observe a lot just by looking. <laughs> 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 so, 
So I'm just always observing. So I noticed that on the flight of United, which I do not recommend to you, um, <laughs> I do not recommend United to you, apart from some of the Russian airlines, I would say, the worst, you know, she never smiled in seven hours, <laughs> which we, not once, you know, never smiled. So you can market the shit out of everything, but if you can't get people to do what they've got to do, you're dead and buried, yeah? Miserable bitch. <laughs> Miserable bitch. <laughs> they hire them. They, they, United, they run things up. Hey, you miserable <coughs> bitch. You, you, you'll do well at United. <laughs> so here are 21 possible reasons why somebody might choose you. And don't forget, you will get the video, so you'll be able to go through this properly. And I'm trying... I'll be frank with you. that I've, I, can, I can talk. This is probably... This is a threat. Um, <laughs> I can talk about this subject for two days, and I have done, um, because it's a, there's a lot to it. Yeah, there's a lot to it. So I'm trying to go through the main things that I can in half a day. Yeah. So these are reasons why somebody might want to choose you. You know, think about that. Could all be perfectly good reasons why somebody might want to choose you. There's some good examples, you know. I remember there was one that was the most expensive. It used to run as it was the most expensive electric razor in the world. Did extremely well, you know, because people were curious. Oh, if it's expensive, it must be good, you know. The things that people love. People tend to love. I fly, as I was saying, a lot to New York. And so I generally, if I can afford United, <laughs> I go on United sometimes because I'm so bloody cheap. <laughs> so... So I go with Virgin and British Airways, yeah? And, you know, they're pretty much the same. You think about it, yeah? They fly the same plane from the same airports. They take the same time to arrive at other airports. They have the same crew, the same... They're the same, yeah? So what's the difference? It's the way they treat you, you know, whether they're nice or not. So there are very subtle differences. The people on Virgin are friendlier. The people on BA are more efficient, yeah? And the people on Gulf are fucking rude. Yeah? <laughs> so that's all. Yeah. Sold in a special way. Do you sell in a, you know, online? Do you only sell in a certain way? Do you sell door to door? Do you sell through, you know, whatever? You know? There's a point to all this. So each may supply the key to your business, actually, and to your approach. Now I'd like you to do a little bit of work for me. Oh, here's an example. I saw this in Bristol. <laughs> that is great. Most, most slogans are bollocks. How many people here have spent any time trying to come up with a slogan or a, a line? How many of you? Yeah. It's usually it's corporate masturbation. Yeah? <laughs> corporate masturbation. Hey, the latest one. Visa is on. Fuck off. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? Visa is on. Be more fucking dog. <laughs> Be more dog. What are you talking about? Where, how far up your arse are you? Yeah? This says something, yeah? This says something. Yeah? If it's not saying something, don't bother. Yeah? I haven't got time to go into this, but you can see I could go on about it for quite a long time. I collect them. I collect them. Yeah? Uh, the, the one they used to have on the way to Montclair on the, uh, from New York. The car in front is a Toyota. Fuck off. What, 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 if, what if it's a Mercedes, you know? <laughs> the British, uh, the other one, always going forward. Well, that was for some branch of the British. Always go, What happens if we have to fucking retreat? Does anybody remember Dunkirk? <laughs> yeah? It's all bollocks, you know. It's, you know, people sitting around in table wanking. Okay, you, now you tell me what's better. But why don't you spend a couple of minutes and write down and tell me for yourself what's better about you? What do you do that's better? Yeah?
you notice that none of the people, most of you are paying, half of you aren't paying at all, I mean people like him, you know, he is paying actually. <laughs> Uh, the other half of you are paying, the other half are masochists. No, you're all paying except for, I think, one, per no, two people. Mm. So don't feel put upon. There's one seat here if there's somebody trying to get a seat. You've missed all the best jokes, haven't you? It's true, isn't it? <laughs> I'm running out. I'll leave you to think about that for a, for a while because it's actually an, an incredibly simple question, <laughs> very often but rather difficult to answer, isn't it? Yeah? I delight in uh, the stuff that I see. You know, I, I collect it every day. There's very few days when I don't find something and write it down. Um, and I seriously recommend it to you, yeah, seriously. Like, keep an eye all the time. If you're professional, yeah? If you're professional. If you don't want to be professional, I don't know what you're doing here. Um, if you're professional, you've always got one part of your mind looking for things that you see, you know. And not just to do with, don't just concentrate on things that are to do with your business, yeah? Anything you see, you never know where, because great creative ideas come from apparently disconnected things, yeah? What is that? What is that? What, what are they? What is it? It's called a waste of money. Yeah? If you look at that, what does it look like? It looks like a load of shoes, right? What are they selling? They're selling a car. Yeah? <laughs> You know what, this is probably a big breakthrough in, you know, some sort of understanding of things. If you show a load of shoes, people think you're selling bloody shoes, yeah? Not cars. Twat standing looking smooth, yeah? <laughs> you're trying to sell luggage, pal. What's the headline to that? Luggage Tell? without compromise. Luggage without compromise. Oh! <laughs> bollocks. It's just bollocks. It's just bollocks. You know? Why should I start reading something that I just can't bear to look at your website? What's in that for me? Yeah? I know my website is shit. Are you going to tell me what I can do about it? Would that be a step in the right direction, perhaps? Yeah. Ha! Ah. Fuck wits anonymous at it. Yeah. Ah, sailed. It's all plate, plate. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Isn't that clever, eh? No longer a nice to have. Always beware of phrases like that. Yeah. Sort of the sort of crap that people talk to each other. Don't use them. Anyhow, again, they're showing it. What's this got to do with social media? A picture of a guy on a thing. Actually, social media is probably more rubbish talked about. So social media and content are equal, neck and neck, in the race towards madness. Yeah? 
the guy, incidentally, I mentioned to you, right, does about the, the Content Marketing Institute. You know, you can call yourself an institute. I started an institute, the Small Business Institute. I made an awful lot of money very quickly in 1967, no, 1970. Yeah, 1970, very quickly by calling it the Small Business Institute. It ran for many, many years. I just took my, a magazine that I had, an e a newsletter I owned called the Business Ideas Letter and changed it into an institute. Sales doubled. <laughs> Fantastic, you know, the institute, oh, institute, oh, it's a, oh well, you know. Well, this guy said, he, he actually admitted, he said, I reckon that we've got maybe two more years to run before the content marketing mania vanishes. This is true, Because yeah? anything you send out is content, yeah? anything. It's just words, pictures that may move, you know, that's all it is. Don't worry about the labels, worry about what you're doing. Yeah? This is something you should be aware of. Pictures of idiots in meetings, you know, I mean, <laughs> so somebody, they've got a, a, a website that shows a picture of idiots in meetings and you think, what do you think? Wow, I'd love to be there. <laughs> oh yeah? <laughs> oh, oh, that's, I'm always, <laughs> The one I like. Yeah, happy families, get an instant quote, avoid them. Yeah. They make so much money, these people, are people in the insurance business, you know, that they can run all kinds of crap, you know, and they do. And there's another one. This is multiracial. Yeah? So, what do we want some, have you got any black people we could put in there? I should tell you that I've been married to a black lady. Well, she wasn't. Actually, the, throughout my, the years of my relationship with her, I met her when she, before she was married to anyone. Well, no, she was on her second marriage. And uh, then she was a Negro. Negro. Then she was black. Once you've gone black, you're going back. Then she be, became colored. Then she was an African American. No matter what she was, she was fucking expensive, I can tell you that. <laughs> she cost me a fortune. She's still got three houses of mine. <laughs> so these are the things that are going to govern the results you get, yeah? What's the medium? You know, where are you going? Because that's how you reach people, yeah? Is it cheap or expensive? Mm. What am I getting for my money? <coughs> How familiar is what you sell? You know, so you don't have to say so much about something that's very, very familiar. Mm. There are three stages in a market. Markets are like move, animals, they move. There is the first stage when you've got something completely new, the first person with a computer, yeah? uh, and you have to explain what a computer is. Yeah? and how it does things better than what existed before. Yeah? The second stage is when other people start selling computers, you have to explain what a computer is, how it's better than what was there before, and also why it's better than the competition. The third stage is when everyone's making computers, yeah? and then you have to focus mostly on how it's better than competition. Yeah? So that all these things come into play when you're selling something. Yeah? Is it complex or simple? The more complex it is, the more you're going to have to say, yeah? Do the people like or trust your brand? If people trust your brand, they will buy twice, uh, twice or even three times as likely to buy from you, yeah? What do you want them to do? The more I want you to do, the more I've got to say to get you to do what I want you to do, or I've got to break up the message into different, a series of communications, yeah? What do I want them to do? You know, the more I want you to do. Click, that's easy. Give me, my, give me your name, that's not so easy. Convert from something to something, you know. Convert from an inquirer to something, you know. That's harder still. I want you to inquire, I want you to try, I want you to buy. You will get a message from me, uh, sealed with a loving kiss, later on today. And you will see it is ten pages long. And when you read it, you'll realise why it's 10 pages long. Very, very important to understand that the fact that somebody who's inquired doesn't mean they're going to be the best bet in terms of sales, yeah? And that does not in turn mean that they're going to be the best bet in terms of long-term customer value, the value of the customer, yeah? You've got to think about these things. 
A lot of people spend a lot of time talking about clicks and open rates and this, that and the other. It's irrelevant. I just want to know, did you give me your money? Yeah. Did you give me your money? So those are factors that come into play. How long have people been on your list? Yeah? The longer they've been on the list, the more likely they are to be a good bet. Yeah? This is Sainsbury's. This is the sort of thing that goes on. That people don't think there's anything to do with marketing, but I went to Sainsbury's and they had a big thing that said, see our new fish, fresh fish thing. I thought, that's interesting, because their fish counter has been shit. Yeah? Let's go and see what they've got. So I walk in to see their magnificent new fish counter, yeah? Do you know what? I was really surprised. Their new fish counter looks exactly like their old fish counter. <laughs> it's had the same incompetence in charge who are unable to clean a fish. Yeah? <laughs> what did I think? I thought, Sainsbury's are a bunch of liars. Yeah? You can't beat the truth, my mother used to say. The minute you start lying, you're in trouble. Yeah? I'm going to go through comments made by my partner, Al, and Al, who is the most forgetful person I know apart from myself, and my dedicated personal assistant, Kelly. I don't know which, whether Kelly's more forgetful than I am, or I am more, but it's surprising we even got here. So Al, I said, send me a picture of yourself, Al, and of course he forgot. Yeah? So I thought, I'll send you a picture of his bloody dog. That's me with his dog. An incredibly stupid German shepherd. You need to skip past this bit. <laughs> <laughs> so he made lots of comments on things that you sent to him. And if you, if I don't cover enough, because we're trying to cover a lot, if I don't say enough, please do not hesitate to contact me and say, you didn't say enough about so-and-so, could you say something else? I'm more than happy to do it. I do it all the time, yeah. And some of the things I say are relevant. <laughs> well, this is something um, that I really want to comment to, to uh, Rick Pullen on at some length, because it's actually, uh, that headline is mine and it was taken from something he'd written that I thought could be improved. And he's curious and he's about to run it, he's to change what I wrote, and he's about to run it again. And there's a, a video in there, and I haven't got a copy of the video, so I'm, I'm going to just go over that, but I'd be very happy to talk to Rick on this subject. Um, somebody sent this. I have no idea what's going on here. It's a bit of a mystery. If I, I want to know exactly how you're going to help my business to grow, who, who is it? Who is the university? I want to know how you're going to do it, darling. Very happy to talk to you about it. I've actually done, I was born in Liverpool. You know. What can I tell you? My son has played in the cabin. He does, he's one of my sons, does a very, very impressive Paul McCartney. He's a left handed bass guitarist and he looks like Paul McCartney. And I used to dance in the cabin before you were born, before any of you were born. I used to dance at lunchtime back in 1957 because I used to waste my time. But you're not saying how. You, one example, for instance, would make a ton of difference, yeah? Those are just vague statements, knowledge, blah, blah, they're just adjectives. They're not, they're not, they're nouns, you know, they're not. Also, it's reversed out, which makes it difficult to read, very difficult to read. You know, reversing things, copy out in large volumes, Halves comprehension, yeah. Um, and it's got that, I don't know what it, that octopus on the right, I don't know what it's doing there. Um, I don't know, but I think universities are about people, and if you don't put people in your ads, you're crazy. You don't need pictures of demented octopuses. So. I'm sure you didn't do it yourself, so. No, go and shoot the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked me about this? It's an input. I, t I have to tell you something. I don't bloody understand uh, these things. I just look at it and I go, oh? Uh? Yeah, but some people do understand them. So some of us like to be communicated in that way, and some of us <coughs> don't. What was the comment made by uh, Al? Platform. Pardon? Pla about the platform. Standing on a burning platform. 
Have you got it? Yes. I can't. I can't. Uh, I cannot lie about what I said, which is not not uncomplimentary, but very interesting. He's, Al has a gift. He's a, you know I've I've trained a lot of copywriters, and Al's really tremendously commercial. And he said, what he said. Although there is a checklist on the infographic, for me the most important message is. Here's how we're going to take this problem off your hands and put it to bed, because in case you haven't noticed, you're standing on a burning platform. Ah! Yeah? Fear of loss is more effective than hope of gain. Yeah. So it, it's the message. What's it? It's just a, it doesn't have the thing that's going to get me interested. Yeah? But for, as I say, for me, I look at these things and, it, and I think, I don't know where I go next. I don't know enough about... I must apologise. I don't know as much as I should about research into comprehension of infographics, but I suspect we all like to receive information in different ways. Yeah? So uh, to me, anyhow, if that is not accompanied by something that's written that explains <coughs> all these things, you're in, I think you're probably in trouble. That's my opinion. Again, please, if you want to talk to me about this you know, later, maybe not today, write to me. I always reply. If I don't reply, it's because I've because I'm incompetent. So you write to me again, and I do reply, and I reply to, to people all over the world all the time with helpful messages such as, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whose is this? This is bloody good. Your stuff is bloody good, yeah? I looked at your stuff, and I thought it was bloody good with some reservations. Um, you see, he's got these little handwritten things. They always work, yeah? It's just, it's full of interruptive things. People love interruptive things, yeah? Um, and it's got a very, you know, did you know? That always works, you know, 80% blah, 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 an exact figure, 96%, yeah? Seriously, think about throwing the computer out of the window at least once a week. Pretty good, yeah? Uh, I, if I were working with you, I would probably be saying, let's look at different ways of opening. Definitely. Yeah. Just remember, you know, if you don't, if they don't, we did research at Ogilvy that found that if people read the first 250 words of a very, very long ad, they would, 75% of them would read the lot, yeah? So it's what you say at the beginning is what you've got to think about all the time. Spend, David once said that uh, once you've written your headline, you've spent 80% of your money because 80% of the people never get beyond the headline. So when you're looking for ideas, what you've got to do is write down lots of different ways you think you can begin. And I don't know how often you, how many you do, but yeah, you, your stuff is. Then there's this one. Uh, great. Uh, again, I would be thinking about the opening of the headline. Oh, definitely, that was my immediate reaction. Like, oh, that's a very good headline. Let's see if we could try a few more. That was I would be very tempted to do uh, the same sort of thing as you've done in the letter and try something, some interruptive visual device. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But you see, you've got captions. This is a professional job. I don't know what you're doing here. You don't need to be here. Mm. But I'm not giving you your money back. No, <laughs> if you insist, all right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love this one. I just love this one. I bloody love it. You see, it's human. You know, we try and find something that people feel strongly about. Is there anybody who's got a car who doesn't have strong views on traffic wardens? Like death. <laughs> Great. See, he's got a little pen and ink thing around there. You know, very good. Very good, and doesn't mess about, you know. He doesn't say, uh, I'm going to write a short letter because people won't read long letters, will they? Fuck off. Look at that, I love it. Very good, very good. Here's somebody asking about, a con these are Al's comments, so I should read them in a slight Birmingham accent. <laughs> Avoid jargon, and he, I'm going to go through this, and it's it really interesting to see the way he thinks, because he's, he's very smart. Think like your prospect. 
talk like a peer, never needy, never begging for business. Yeah? If you don't think they need what you offer, you lack conviction and you're in the wrong business slash job. Yeah? Yeah. Avoiding jargon is easy. Jargon is shit that you hear all the time. And for those of you who sit in meetings, it's what you hear in meetings. It's just the set phrases that keep on coming out all the time. You know, about, are we looking at our content in the right way? Yeah. Emotion is easy to talk a lot about emotion. Uh, you will notice, by the way, if you have noticed anything I've said, that I get pretty emotional about things. Yeah? I don't say, oh, I don't think that's a very good idea. I say, these bastards should be shot. Because if you don't feel strongly about it, you won't do anything about it. Yeah? Maybe my language is not politically correct. But you get the, get the point. Yeah? Here's my friend Danny Hatch, who's just retired. Who anybody, has anybody ever seen a thing called Who's Mailing What? Who's Mailing What? Danny Hatch is a guy I met 20 odd years ago maybe more, who ran this thing called, and he, he, what he did was he used to go through all the mailings sent in America, which is quite large, and he would kept a record of which ones were doing well and which ones were not. Yeah? And now he, then he started doing <coughs> the things with emails. We regularly meet in, either in England or America, but he's just retired. He's even older than me, which I thought was impossible. Um, he's just retired, and these are the seven emotions that he says you should hang your hat on. Greed, guilt, fear, flattery, anger, salvation, exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that you've got to deploy. Tracy. Yep. Tracy, can you give examples of some phrases that might use greed or guilt or fear? He's going to. Oh, right. <laughs> um, actually, Flattery, well, we'll go. So he loves, he loves flattery. He particularly likes salvation and exclusivity. Yeah? Just a point about emotion. This is the former president of Brazil. Uh, and he said something really interesting that I made a note of at the time. Pockets are the most sensitive part of a human being. That's why we need to engage, touch hearts and minds first. Yeah. Very interesting statement. Yeah. Why do you think they're all killing each other in the Middle East? It's all to do with emotion. Yeah. It's not logic. Yeah. Why on earth does anybody think that Donald Trump is anything other than a bloody crook? You know. Emotion. Yeah. They're fed up with politicians talking shit at them. Yeah, he sounds sincere even though he's gone broke four times and but he's a brilliant businessman. <laughs> Unbelievable. So this is something I collected. Um, This is the one I like, the next one. Yeah. <laughs> I speak for the over 70s, actually. And I'm sort of, I'm like, you know, 90% of us, you know, the over 75s, I can tell you, 97% of us. Yeah. I used to say to people in, uh, in things, I would say, how many of you work with somebody you hate? Don't tell me you're not involved with emotion, you know. <laughs> Here are three emotions that I find are very powerful. Greed, mentioned by Danny. Fear. Sloth, people are lazy. Yeah? If you can find a way of using these emotions, you will.
it could all go wrong very quickly, or worse, it's gone wrong, what can I do? Now what? Yeah? Very, very strong. Yeah? This is what he thinks. Uh, he likes exclusivity because it's human nature to feel smarter than the next guy. A bit special, a master in your field. Um, I'll d just one example is worth a ton of rubbish, you know, so he gives lots of examples. Yeah. So exclusivity gives you the license to feel that you're special. Yeah. I said I worked for the American Express card for a long time, and what was the thing that got that built them up. It wasn't their advertising, it was a letter that began, quite frankly, the American Express card is not for everyone, and not everyone who applies is accepted. Yeah. I think I'm going to show you the letter I wrote that beat that in some place, I'm not sure. But, but that ran for 13 years all over the world. We used to test it twice a year, nothing ever beat it. Yeah. So contact cold, busy prospects are headlined with charm, flattery, and greed. Yeah? Charm, so I'll talk a little bit about charm in a minute. Your first few paragraphs must expand on this. Also, just by doing the above, you'll stand out a, a mile. Case in point. Think of a, a poor teenager standing, trying to get a job to get a crappy job like washing pots, yeah? What do they send? A terrible email and a CV. So, <coughs> Al has a son called Al. <laughs> known in the family as Little Al. So, here's an email he wrote for Little Al. Heading, four reasons to read this email. I'm sure you get asked about job vacancies all the time. In fact, it I bet it drives you mad, so I'll get straight to the point. If you ever need anyone, I'm happy to cover for staff at the drop of a hat, especially in the holiday season, which means that you'll never be left short. You see, he doesn't just say, I'm happy to help. He understands that in the holiday season, they're short of staff. Yeah? So in order to write to people, you have to understand what their problems are. Yeah? I can help you with your social media, which means you can reach more people. I'm a real people person, dealing with customers I enjoy. I'm 16 in September, young and enthusiastic. I'll tackle any challenge whatsoever. Be delighted with the minimum wage. I know you're busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah? I know you're busy, but what if what I've written sounds like the type of person you're looking for, please mail me back and I'll send you my CV. Of course, I'm biased, but I'm sure I can take a weight off your mind. Very, you know, human stuff, yeah? He sent out, you got two job offers. That's a reason, 25% response, you know? 25, yeah. It sticks out a mile. It's written from the manager's point of view and plays on salvation. Anyone who's worked in a bar or restaurant knows the pain. When, this is what you're looking for, the things that pain people, you know, things that make them happy, yeah? things that worry them. One restaurant, when he says, Coob sellers when we've eaten, when I go down, I make my videos for our straight and very often uh, down at Owls, and very often uh, we repair, as they say, to the Coob sellers, and we imbibe a few beverages together. Well, I imbibe most of the beverages because he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> One guy, he wrote back, he said, how could I ignore your email, and then said, Please come and see me when you're, when, when you're 16, yeah? But it's an odd example, as he says, when you think of all the right, all the letters he used to write to CEOs. When we, he heard me speaking somewhere, it's a funny story, but we ended up selling to, uh, communications to CEOs, and we always used greed and flattery. <laughs> How to overcome early objections. A dumb question, he said. Why is it a dumb question? Objections are a strong buying sign. The prospects have begun weighing up your proposition. Yeah? Long copy demolishes every objection one by one. Yeah? So you need long copy. You deal with them. And as I say, if it interests them, they'll read a book about it. Yeah? I'm going to show examples of that later on. 
somebody's got an alumni loyalty club. Um, not you, is it? No. Who's got an alumni stroke loyalty club? Here, two of the seven key emotions come into play, exclusivity and greed. Press these two buttons and any loyalty club has a strong chance of working. Yeah? And here's an example. Last week at a party, the host was saying how chuffed he was. He'd borrowed a pal's macro card. You know what a macro card is? It enables you to buy wholesale, <coughs> to buy all the food and booze. You could almost see one chap swell with pride when he boasted that he too had a macro card. <laughs> If you want to so hang on. If you want a, more advice on that, all you have to do is send me some stuff and I'll comment on it. Yeah, I've done a lot of work in that field. Um, at one time, people used to come into my agency in Covent Garden, and I would greet them at the door and say, "Good morning. Would you like to start a club?" <laughs> people, like human beings, love to belong. If you want to sell to busy. Oh, coal prospects, logic. Who asked about logic versus emotion? Did anyone? Or maybe it was just what he was saying, yeah. Um, learn to write so you can crowbar emotions into your sales pitch. Everyone knows emotion is stronger than reason, but so few profit from it. And I don't care what your service or product is, you can always add emotion in some way. Who wants more sales from their site? Who doesn't want? You want more. Is that you? Does anyone else? Who else? Want? Well, a few of you may want more sales from your site. I'm going to talk a bit about sites. Um, run a flash sale. I live with a la an Italian lady who started uh, working for me and who's much cleverer than me. She's a PhD in philosophy, a doctor of philosophy. You must have seen her talk. Did you see her talk? She's a very, very clever. She wo worked for a firm called Hargreaves Lansdowne, who are the biggest in their field. I don't know if you know them, they sell pensions. Peter is worth more than all the Rolling Stones to put together. Um, and she just uh, she runs flash sale. I've seen her do it, run a flash sale and bring in 50 million quid, you know, in three days. Yeah? It's, it's so quick, you've only got this one opportunity to get this thing, yeah? Very, very powerful. You're making it suit them. Greed and the fear of missing out kicks in. Yeah. Long copy. When you sell, again, when you sell with conviction and enthusiasm, long copy is easy to spew out and edit to shape. Go for it. Do it. Yeah. Also, often folk can't be bothered if they can. It's never used because they listen to clueless morons. It's too long. I'll never read all that. You can see that I've got. Al well trained, actually. No, he was very good before I met. He started, he was selling computers. That's how he was making a living. He's a salesman. How to write long copy sales pages. Who asked about that? Anyone? Nobody asked about it. Well, in that case, we will ignore that. <coughs> no, we won't. Follow a proven template and crowbar in the seven emotions. Here's the template I use for every profitable sales page I've ever done. This is Bob Stone's template. First, come up with your biggest benefit. Second, immediately expand on this. Third, be specific. Yeah. I'm going to show you quite a lot of copy anyhow. Here. See how it's done. Proofs and testimonials. Offer. <coughs> What will happen if they don't act? Fear of loss, this is something I've discovered more important than hope of gain. Yeah? Recap with a call to action. Don't ask and tell them. Be helpful but incomplete. The biggest mistake folk make is being complete. Yeah? If I tell you everything, there's no reason for you to want to know more. If you leave your audience thinking, great, I'll just go away and do that, you sh haven't shot yourself in the book, but while warm, fuzzy feelings and goodwill are great, you can't take them to the bank. Yeah? Get them reaching for their wallets to get the big picture with all the detail. So an example of helpful but incomplete copy would be a webinar on long copy. Yeah? 
start to it, but you don't tell them everything. For instance, but we all know emotion is stronger than reason. Did you know there are seven key emotions? And did you know you can crowbar them into any product or service? They take a robust template and transform it into a battle horse. You can trounce the competition with knocking sales in consistently day after day. What are they? I'll be covering them in my next video. Sign up now. Yeah? <laughs> it's like at the, end of the at the end of a page, if you're writing something with a lot of pages, you always put at the end, you break in the middle of a paragraph and you say, please read on. Yeah. So, I mean, any, who, who was asked about the web? Who asked about the webinars? Anyhow? Anybody? It might have been you. Might have been you? Oh, you're probably on a plane somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> How to get the basics in place for a new business? Who asked about that? I don't see anybody. Oh, it's you. Site and brochures, etc. This is running before you can walk. It's a mistake established businesses make all the time. First, put all of your time into creating a process to build your list. Without this, you don't have a business. What good is a brand website or brochure without prospects? I have no idea why so many people ignore this. It's more important than anything else. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the axe. Abram Lincoln. Yeah, Put me in front of a prospect and, and I spend the first 40 minutes bullying them into how they must build their list. <laughs> a strategy slash processes for winning work, who's that? I think a lot of people sent in, it wasn't you was it? You're all, listen, I'm 70 bloody nine, I can't remember anything, what's your problem? <laughs> Making sure it's professional. Oh, oh boy, this is, oh, he's going to go on. This is, Al loves all this. Continually build your list. Be helpful after they're on it. Don't be shy with your offers. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. That's just all the time. Keep going. Yeah. What have you done to this, Kel? Oh. Ooh. Suddenly. As for being professional, this is so true. I'm the wrong person to ask. I'm in the ready fire aim soon. I drive you mad. This is to me saying, he always says to me, good enough you. I say, what the fuck have you done there, Al? You've missed it. He said, good enough usually is. <laughs> so he, it, that's, he covers a lot of ground very quickly. So he can back his winners and cut his losers. Yeah? <clears throat> the older and more established a business, the more professional it gets. Too many folks spend squander time and money on being professional. My favourite example is Peter Hargreaves. She started at home after stealing clients from his employer. You can't get more unprofessional, <laughs> but look at him now. Profit allows you to become professional and should always come first. So make the money first, don't worry about being professional. Yeah. Engage people with... I can't... Who said this, engage people with your marketing collateral? Anyone? Nobody knows. Good. I hate words like mar marketing collateral. I don't even know what it is. Be helpful. He actually said, what a dumb question. <laughs> but then he said, be helpful. That's all you have to do. Yeah. Compe <laughs> <laughs> Compelling copy for technical content. This is really interesting. I, I, there's, he's talking about a client. I once did a seminar for them in Portland, Oregon. And I nearly got barred from the United States because <laughs> I'd done the wrong thing in Canada. Um, so, it doesn't matter how complicated the sell, it all boils down to time and money. Tektronix used this for years and they were huge, billion, multi-billion com dollar company. And we just edited all that stuff. Actually, I did a lot of the bloody work, so he's talking nonsense. <laughs> Pointing out how their oscilloscopes save time and money, a two minute job, it got great results. Here's a piece of copy, yeah? Highlighted are the emotions I brought to the party, yeah? And he says, save money equals greed, save time equals salvation. A very simple case of the prospect thinking like everybody else on the planet, what's in it for me? Technical sales are the one time to use jargon because you're only interested in folk that understand the jargon, yeah? So, oh, here's the Tektronix thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
So what is it? So salutation. So the heading, you know, serial data network signal path analysis for data rates. Wow, does that give you the bloody horn or what? <laughs> so working on serial designs, S parameter and TDR measurements. Here's how to avoid the cost, time and cost of a VNE image of the thing, the guide. And then it's why take all day calibrating with the new DSA blah, 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 as little as five seconds. Uh, it takes as little as five seconds and gives you 100% confidence in the results by making true differential measurement. Best of all, right now you can save up to 50%. It's all straight sell, but with a bit of, you know, enough of the technical stuff in there so that they know you know what you're talking about, yeah? And I'll, I'll make another point about that a little later. Um, phrase benefits, by far the best question submitted. Who said, how do you phrase benefits in compelling ways? You've all forgotten what you said. Who said it? Anybody? Nobody, it's him. It's bloody the, f the plague of Australia. <laughs> uh, you just said it was the best question, so I thought I'd, I thought yeah. I'd, say, I thought I'd say yes. Yeah, we all did it. <laughs> we all I'm really I've, I've, been, I've, I've, how many times have you seen me? I'm, you're going to get barred next time. You, <laughs> you imagine how desperate he must be. It's not all to do in Australia. He comes over to, to, to check on my jokes, you know. <laughs> Learn how to write with Sean, then add nod factor. Not easy. Nod is what I used to say to my copywriters. I said the aim of the thing is to get people nodding in agreement at the start and keep them nodding all the way to the order form. Nod, 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 nod. Yeah. So charm, I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's it, how you become compelling in persuasion. And number two, tell a story. And I told you a story about my parents. Did you like the story? Yeah? You can't beat a story. And he's got, here are some examples. Uh, the most famous uh, mailing ever sent out, really, which ran for 32 years on change for the Wall Street Journal. I won't go through it in detail, I'll show it to you. And also the Zippo ad, the amazing story of a Zippo that worked after being taken from the belly of a fish, which is one of David Ogilvy's favourites. And this is, uh, this is for something I wrote for Kane Knight, and this is a wonderful example, they're lawyers. Or they're in the legal field. It worked so well, they never ran it again. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> they, they justify firms' legal bills. You know, people are arguing about the bill. They justify, this is why. Um, um, you know, cases can drag on forever. Yeah? Um, so the letter worked so well, by the way, that even their financial director was impressed. I always remember the managing director. I said, even our financial director likes it. And he's dead from the neck up. <laughs> and this is the heading I wrote. Um, what the hell's going on here, Kel? Have I gone to... Oh, oh yeah, sorry. They try to settle with a silly offer and then they play the waiting game. So I think of it. I try to find the situation, the exact situation that they're in. Yeah? Yeah? So why put up with it? It's easy to avoid. So it's just begin, faced with the prospects of your fees being slashed or a lengthy wait to justify them, what do you do? So that's, that's the problem, yeah? Hit them with the problem. Your billing is the lifeblood of your practice and the big insurers know it, yet they're easier to beat than you think. As you'll see, it's easier than you may have thought and you can do something about it right now. But perhaps, best of all, you'll instantly put an end to three troublesome bedfellows who all appear always appear when we're forced into playing the waiting game. Bad cash flow, less billable time, and unnecessary overheads, yeah? So that's how you get them going. From. And this is not a short letter because they're selling something expensive, yeah? Yeah, three pages, yeah? Did extremely well. David's favourite. Zippo, the lighter that works. The amazing story of a Zippo that worked after being taken from the belly of a fish. 1950. One of the big problems that we have is that people think that if it's recent, it must be better. It isn't. That is better than 99% of the ads being run today. Yeah? It's just better. Yeah?
Here's the Wall Street Journal one, and I'm just going to do a little test I've done many, many times. Dear reader, on a beautiful late spring afternoon, 25 years ago, two young men graduated from the same university. They were very much alike, these two young men. Both were good students, personable, and as young graduates are, filled with ambitious dreams of the future. How many of you, when I say, on a beautiful late spring afternoon, 25 years ago, two young men graduated from the same university, have a mental picture? It doesn't tell you anything. I used to do tests and I'd say, so how many of you can see these two young men walking, walking along beside a stream of water with trees and a wind blowing? And people say, yeah. So they don't fucking tell you anything about that, yeah? It's incredible. So that ramp up, again, well worth studying, well worth reading. Many of my clients have simply taken this letter and copied it what for their the own. Difference? Fun? What made the difference? What made the difference? Well, have you ever wondered, as I have, what makes this kind of difference in people's lives? It isn't always a native intelligence or talent or dedication. It isn't that one person wants success and the other doesn't. The difference lies in what each person knows and how he or she makes use of that knowledge. And that is why I'm writing to you and to people like you about the Wall Street Journal Europe, for that is the whole purpose of the Journal Europe, to give its readers knowledge, knowledge they can use in business. Yeah. You can apply that to almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well worth studying, well worth studying. The more you study, the better you'll do. They have a free offer, save up to 15% on your subscription, plus a free colour map of Eastern and Central Europe, and the guide to understanding money and investment. And what I'm about to show you is extremely important. Please remember it. That's the guide. Yours free. Welcome to the intriguing and often baffling world of money and investing, a world that seems remote, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Explains everything about the guide. And on the other side, everything about the guide. Why? Because it's not enough to say, get a free gadunk, yeah? If it's free, it's worth fuck all, yeah? Therefore, your incentive must be solved. You have to imagine that people have to pay money for it. You have to persuade them that it's so good they would pay money for it, yeah? Otherwise, it's worth nothing. That's where people screw up. They're free so and so. Not enough. I remember Martha, my partner, talking to me about uh, Hargreaves Lansdowne, who were clients of mine for a while until the, the swine side are away from me. <laughs> Paid her twice as much money. Um, greed for gold is a terrible thing. So. She said, oh, we, we, we tested it. We used to offer a free wallet, a leather wallet. Yeah. No, an imitation leather wallet. Yeah. People say that incentives don't work. So millionaires would write in to say, where is my free wallet? <laughs> so they tested something else. They tested a, a free pen. That did better than the wallet. Yeah. And when the pen did better than the wallet, they then tested a free cross pen. That did better still. And then they said, a free cross pen with a gold-plated nib. That did better still. Yeah. And then they tested, a f they currently test a free cross pen. I've got one, actually. Worth £149 with a blah, blah. And that did better still. Yeah. What am I doing? I'm very fortunate. I've made many, many friends. I'm a happy man, actually, um, believe it or not. Um, I made many friends, and one of the friends that I admired greatly was a man I worked with in the 1950s, seven or eight, I don't know. And we used to do uh, imperial leather soap and a number of other things. And he started the first direct marketing, and one of the best direct marketing agencies in Britain. He's retired now, a guy called Graham McCorkle. And he once said to me, he said, be as generous with your incentives as you possibly can. Don't go over, don't do what Hoover did and offer free holidays and go broke as a result. 
for <laughs> which they did very quickly, you know. You know, because who's in charge of the marketing department? Oh, we, we ran an ad looking for idiots. Do you know about marketing directors? I love marketing directors. At one point, marketing directors were so incompetent that the average length of tenure of a marketing director in this country was 18 months. You imagine, time to make lots of promises, time to screw up, time to be noticed. People know, he screwed up. Time to get fired. Time to get another job. No problem, because what do the companies do when they're looking for a marketing director? They don't look for somebody who might make a great marketing director. They look for somebody who's already done the job, in most cases, badly. Yeah? It's amazing. Really, that's another subject. OK, so be as generous with your incentives as you can. I, lot, as I was saying, lots of my clients have copied that, you know, adapted it. It's because it's a before and after, and it's a story. It's a combination of the two, yeah? I can spend, again, uh, any of you have been with R straight, and I'm pretty sure I've got on, on the R straight and uh, thing, I've, I've analysed that, haven't I, in one of the videos? Yeah. yeah. It's 11. Is it time to bugger off then? <laughs> right, finished, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, it's all over. <laughs> Terminado. <laughs> OK, if you'd like to, have to avail yourself of the refreshments, ladies and gentlemen.